Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of The County Seat. I'm your host, Chad Booth. You know, most of us, when we think of cattle and agriculture, we have pictures at either end. One, we see the display of the roast beef on the dinner table, or two, we see John Wayne sitting around a campfire surrounded by cattle playing the harmonica and eating beans. In between that process is a lot of business, and that's the focus of our show today, to look at the business side of agriculture and what it takes to be a beef rancher in today's age. Ranching is as old as the idea of the West itself. The cowboy mystique has permeated our culture and it's inspired people from around the world to dream of the freedom of riding the ranges of the Rockies. Butch Jensen is the owner and operator of one of the largest ranches in Utah and he still rides the same lands as his ancestors, reaching back more than a century. My family, we own and operate the Tavaputs TN Ranching Company here in southeastern Utah. My wife's family, Jeannie, started here, uh, her family started in 1889. Our ranch is a combination of Jeannie's family and uh, my family, so her family started in 1889 and uh, my side of the family started about 1918. While the lifestyle of ranching may have a certain image that goes along with it, at the end of the day, it is a business and it has to be profitable. That reality means a lot of hard work has to go into making ends meet far more than most people realize. We're a cow-calf operation. We calve in the spring about the first of March. Our cattle go to the high country up on the Tavaputs in the summertime. Wintertime we bring them down, calves are weaned. We market these calves uh, about Thanksgiving time. These calves are born in the spring weighing uh, 60, 70 pounds. Uh, by the time we ship these calves uh, Thanksgiving time, uh, these calves are weighing 700 pounds. So we get some real phenomenal growth here on the ranch. Uh, and, th and that's our main income is our cattle operation. So now the cows get pregnancy checked, all their uh, vaccination shots. Now we kick our, our mother cows out on the winter range, go through the winter, come March 1, the whole operation starts all over again. We make our, our living selling the calves in the fall, but we also uh, diversify. We have a summer guest business. Uh, people from around the country will come uh, visit our ranch, see how, how we raise our livestock, um, how we take care of our ground. Um, and then we also have a little bit of a hunting business in the fall. And it all kind of helps make the picture whole. Many ranches, like the Tavaputs, rely on additional income sources to supplement their ranching operation. Even though beef prices may be unpredictable, and the work literally translates to weeks in the saddle, the attraction has more to do with the way of life than the bank account. We think it's a great lifestyle because we, we can have our kids with us all the time. Our kids are with us day in and day out, uh, whether we're trucking cattle to the desert or we're branding or we're working the summer operation. Uh, our kids are with us and, and learning the, the way of the ranching life. Ranchers do face many challenges in the modern world. We may think of cowboys as the last vestige of the Old West, but once we start to see them as individuals trying to make a living like everyone else, it's easier to appreciate what they go through to put food on the table for their families and ours. For the county seat, I'm Terry Wood. Well, now that we have an idea of how much diversity it takes to sustain the ranching lifestyle, when we come back, we'll look at the scope of the problem and some of the variables that make it a really tricky business right here on the county seat. 149 million years in the making, dinosaurs once roamed this land. Now they're found at the Dinosaur National Monument. Let's take you beyond the bones. We call it Dinosaur Land. You'll find it offers adventures and sights not seen anywhere else in the world. Come to Dinosaur Land, Vernal, Utah. You'll want to stay forever. The dinosaurs did. When the road takes you farther than you knew possible, when the world is more beautiful than you've ever seen, when home is more comfortable than it should be, this is when you know you're in Kane County. The perfect mix of rural and urban, culture and adventure. Glendale, Orderville, Kanab, Big Water, small towns with more to offer than just peace and quiet. Kane County, Utah. Find the new you. Thank you. 
unlimited opportunity for adventure. It's all about knowing where to look. ATV adventures, rock crawling events, art festivals, and wildlife events. The opportunities are limitless. Pick your adventure in Millard County. Beautiful scene, isn't it? The great wide spaces of the wild, wild west. Hi, I'm Chad Booth, host of At Your Leisure. I'm asking you to support the Blue Ribbon Coalition. Their efforts responsibly preserve access to our public lands. If it were not for the Blue Ribbon Coalition and their efforts, you may not have access to millions of acres of land across the West. This is America's playground, and if we don't do anything, we are going to lose it. Join, participate, and donate. Welcome back to the county seat. We are talking today about the business side of agriculture, how much impact it has on the state of Utah, and how much of a challenge it is to make that industry work. Joining us for a conversation is uh, Cody James, who is the Director of Animal Industries for the Department of Agriculture and Food. That just creates pictures in my mind, Cody, that, that I, I need to, I, I see like cows working in assembly line. Yeah, among, amongst <laughs> other things too, it seems that way sometimes. And we also have Tim Munns, who is the owner operator of the Flying M Ranch up in Box Elder County. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Thanks. my pleasure to be here. I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about the challenges of ranching. We obviously have seen in the story that you have to be a little bit creative to uh, maintain ranching. It's not like John Wayne out on the range anymore, is it? What kind of what kind of things do you do, Tim, to supplement your ranching business? Well, actually, no. We're in we're in the ranch, cattle ranch, medicine and farming. More ranch, more in enterprises, cattle now. Years past, and I'm not on a family inherited deal, so brag or complain, but it it's it's the best way of life. It's greater, greatest. I always say it's the greatest occupation in the world. It's a poor damn way to make a living, but it it doesn't pay. The rewards are there, but the challenges in our industry is the weather, obviously. We depend on Mother Nature and, and rains mm -hmm. and conditions and stuff. you got animal health issues constantly, but life is good there. Uh, challenges, probably more so, is government regulation, government overreach. They'll regulate us out of it. Our challenges are weather, government, EPA, environmental issues, wildlife issues. When I say that, I mean the Endangered Species Act and some of those deals are the challenges there. But Honestly, we don't supplement our income anything off ag with agritourism or anything at the time being. I mean, my wife both work and my family on the ranch, and and that's kind of unique. You know, I go to a lot of meetings, and the wife is, is the postmaster or school teacher. My wife and me have worked as a team for 40 years and raised our family there, and it's been great. And I've got two sons, one part time, one full time, back on the ranch. You mentioned things that that. Uh, impact your year. Uh, I, I remember Ronald Reagan, in a, before he was president, in a radio broadcast once said that um, a, a, a farmer makes a Las Vegas odds look like um, church bingo or something to that effect, is that the, the people in Las Vegas casinos uh, have no idea what a gambler, uh, of a rancher or farmer has to be. How much can pricing and things like that affect your ability to have a good bottom line in a given year. Well, it's paramount that the market is important. And you're right, when people say you go into Las Vegas gamble, no, we gamble every day on the weather again and on the markets. We have no control over the market. We are we either go to an auction or a video auction, whatever it is, and our, we don't have a standard priced wholesale retail outlet, so we're, we're vulnerable to the markets. And they'll go up and down with supply and demand, which usually dictates the market. And, uh, and we're at the mercy of the market. But the market has been too. We had two great years, 2014 and 15, best years ever had. Now the 40 have been there. The old timers, when I went there 40 years ago, said, now look kid, you make sure you save on the good years for them bad years. Well, I waited 38 years for a good year to get there and we finally had two and, and we saved, but there's risk involved. There's risk involved in any business and in cattle ranch and true. You, you, you can't steal second base leaving your foot on first base. You've got to let go and go and take and a lot of us operate on a lot of borrowed money. I was, it's I a was, high capital industry. I was, was going to ask that. So what, what kind of price variance uh, have you seen in, in the market this well, year versus last? One year, we have over 50% cut in our gross check. I mean, a cut, we didn't see it in May. We made, it was really good in 15 and 14. Depending on when you price your cattle, I usually sell on a cash forward contract. They'll contract these calves April and May for a fall delivery on a 556 weight calf. and. We've got them locked in, but the market 
generally speaking, in the fall is less than it is in the summer. So the question is, and, and I wonder if this is across the board, do ranchers and uh, on their good years just kind of catch up from the losses from their bad years and, and then you just run the cycle all over again? You could say that. Every ever, ever get one paid for, I said to my son, if we ever get one paid for, then we'll expand, and we have expanded quite a bit. But you're right. You better save on them good years. You better budget. You better project expenses, estimate income, and, and, and plan ahead. All right. We're going to take a quick break here on the county seat. When we come back, we are going to chat about uh, some of the programs that Ag and Food helps to kind of smooth out the bumps for people in agriculture. We'll be right back on the county seat. There is a place where looking out means looking in, where an impression lasting only a few seconds will be imprinted on a life forever, where courage is forged and innocence rediscovered, where remembering is rewarding and forgetting unforgettable. There is a place where truth is felt and where seeing is believing. There is a place. What would you do with an extra day in Utah Valley? Explore the Wasatch Mountains? Snap a family photo at Bridal Veil Falls. Cool off on Utah Lake or the Provo River. No matter what you're searching for, you can find it in Utah Valley. Bring everyone together. ATV, check. Four-wheel driving, check. Bouldering, check. Mountain biking, check. Hiking, check. River rafting, check. Adventure is about more than just crossing activities off of a list, but hey, if you can find a place that gives you everything you're looking for, all the better. In Emory County, you'll find the San Rafael Swell, trails, lakes, and the small town hospitality you're looking for. San Rafael Country, in the heart of Utah. Visit us and check something off your list. The weekends just never feel like they're long enough. By the time you get to a destination, you're worn out and you may need a vacation to recover from your last vacation. The solution is closer than you think and that's just what you need. You can find the desert at Little Sahara, the cool refreshment of Yuba Lake, escape to the green of the forest on the Nebo Loop. Make your escape to Juab County. It'll change your family forever. Welcome back to the county seat. We are talking today about the business side of agriculture and what it takes to make a living on the farm. And, and I, I do want to kind of focus a little bit on what the Department of Ag and Food and some of the different federal and state programs are that actually can help level out those highs and lows that you obviously experience from year to year, as, as you've kind of indicated. Um, what's the most important program to help you make it through the lean years that you rely on? Well, you'd better rely on yourself and you'd better have a good banker. <laughs> to, you've got to plan ahead and save some money if you can. I, mean, I realize sometimes you get leveraged out there, but Farm Service Agency, the GIP Grading Improvement, Improvement Program, with, which has come through the Department of Ag, helps ranchers improve their grazing and seeding and water projects. And there is money available there during drought years for water development, development spring run and water lines and stuff. And we appreciate the fact that the state legislature funds the GIP program. Now on a federal level, the Farm Service Agency, which I chair the state committee, there is livestock feed program that will trigger through the drought monitor. You've got to go into the drought monitor and stay there so long and, and different levels there. True, we try and think we're pretty independent, which we are. There is no set government program like milk producers and, and crops, uh, forage and wheat grain programs for the beef industry. So, so you have no subsidies, but there are programs. How, do, how does GIP work? What do you do with GIP? GIP? GIP is a great program. Pretty much what it's doing is is trying to raise the amount of uh, feed on it per acre so you can get more animals on a, a given area uh, for a longer amount of time. And obviously, in the state that we live in, as dry as it could be, as arid, um, it's tough to get those. We talked a little bit uh, in between breaks about the public land versus private land. 
uh, in the western United States, Utah and Nevada especially, as dry as we are, to be able to find a way to get grazing lands to where they're being harnessed for animals and not necessarily being burned like happens. But the grazing improvement program is monitoring all that, helping to seed in different areas to make sure that there's some feed. Well, according to the Farm Bureau, uh, statistically over the last 40 years, uh, AUMs, animal units per month, uh, has reduced statewide by about 65 percent. So the, for the, so the federal government is saying the range is not in good health, we're going to reduce your grazing allocation. Uh, if you come in with a GIP program and improve water resources and actually improve the condition of the range, do they ever reverse those? You know, I'm not so sure if, uh, if we can ever get the, the federal government and especially our local ranchers to see on what should be reversed or if they're going to do that. But the, this program has been able to be followed and be tracking that they are raising the AUMs, that they're putting some, some policies in the place that we're helping these ranchers to get some more feed and to be able to, we've seen, uh, you know, uh, disastrous fires be decreased based on um, what's happened in that grazing improvement program. We've been able to see people stay longer on those areas or, or graze longer on those areas where we've done some work at. And so the hope is that it does help over the long run, especially as we start seeing agriculture, and especially private agriculture, the lands disappear and, and, and the only thing there may be left is, is public lands. So what do you, uh, uh, when, when you are out there on looking at your range, uh, what kind of impacts, like wildlife? Well, you got to take care of the land that'll take care of you. you get to, I mean, the ranchers are the first environmentalists out there and conservationists, but there's a difference between conservation and preservation. We sometimes get too far left or too right with, with wanting to preserve with wilderness and other things, and people want us off public lands or private lands. They're an, an animal ranching, animal industry, animal agriculture, rather. But if you'll take, we're going to take care of that land. We can't abuse it or we won't be in business. Whether it be private or public land, you can't overgraze it. You've got to watch your use. You, you know, the old rule of take half, leave half. We're constantly monitoring that and rotating pastures on a, on a managed grazing program. So we're not grazing the same acres at the same time of year on our private lands. Does Ag and Foo have a program that helps ranchers understand uh, the, the, the improved science? I mean, obviously, uh, range management, I'm sure in your 60 years, has changed significantly. Yeah, you know, improved grasses have come along, different forages have come along, we're planting different grasses. And native grasses are great, but we usually get more AUMs, more pounds per acre, forage inventories higher on improved grasses. And our management practices have changed, true. You, you can be overgrazed and understocked on the same amount of acres, where they're, they're taking selected plants and eating the best ones, like eating the ice cream and leaving the taters. So you want to Cross fencing, GIPS helped us cross fence and other programs so we concentrate them cattle, we eat everything and we move. When I say everything, we eat all the plants and move and rotate more often, uh, bigger herds and and roll in paddocks and moving. Uh, to answer you, we don't necessarily have a program that delves right into to educating, but uh, we do partner with Utah State University Extension, also Arizona. The one that comes to mind is that every year uh, we'll attend the uh, the Arizona Strip workshops. They're what does go into that type of thing. So as you can imagine on the Arizona Strip, what that looks like and trying to, to be a cattle rancher down there. They do have some some courses that they put on and we, we try and be part of that as much as we can, both on the, uh, the from the brand inspection and animal health side to the grazing improvement side, as well to be part of that and let people know what our services are and how we can help them out. But Utah State in this state has been the one that's probably pushing that the most. And as I say, they partner with a lot of other uh, state schools throughout the, the West to do that to help our ranchers and educate them. How hard is it to expand? I mean, it, it's tough. If you a lot of these ranches have been in the same generation, four or five or six. My family's been in agriculture for probably five or six generations. Mm -hmm. I had three, or no, there's four brothers, one sister. I left my dad's place in 1977 and went out. And through the Farmers Home Administration, another government bought a, borrowed the money through a beginning farm program, bought a dry farm in Hansel Valley, and we've since expanded. Low interest rates there was an advantage. It's dang tough, but you just, you got to be pretty frugal. You watch for the neighbors, hope somebody will give you a deal. They're not going to give any better, better deal, but it's tough. Like I said to my boys, once we get one paid for, we'll, we'll try buying some others, and we've done that. But we, I was 100% leveraged when I went out there. With the help of my dad, let me mortgage on his ranch, his farm. Then I bought a place of my own, and we've been real blessed to be there. Excellent. Do you like the lifestyle? Yeah, I mean, the life, 
It's a way of life more than a lifestyle. You can, you can be rich and buy a lifestyle. It's a way of life. This, my kids know it. My son been in the service in his back, and that's what he wants to come home and raise his family there. So it's great. Like I said, it's, it's a really good way to raise a family. It's a damn poor way to make a living. I think I said that once before. <laughs> <laughs> it, it bears repeating. Uh, what do you see as the most valuable tool that ranchers don't know about in the, in the, in the toolbox that Ag and Food has? Well, I think that uh, they know about the majority of the stuff we do. I think that what the, the misunderstanding happens to be is that uh, the Department of Agriculture is trying really hard to, to protect them. At what sometimes it looks like there might be an enforcement issue, but almost every one of, our one of our divisions in the Department of Agriculture is protecting the rancher either as the producer himself, which is the majority of the programs that I oversee, or they're protecting the, the producer as a consumer, which plant industry and, uh, would do by making sure that their, their feeds and seeds and fertilizers they're buying, if they are farming or what they're feeding their, their animals is meeting the requirements that it says it's supposed to. So they're getting the best gain for their buck uh, when they're purchasing that stuff. And then as I mentioned before, we're making sure that the animal health is there and, and that, uh, you know, that uh, Tim's cattle aren't being stolen there is a big protection for them. And the biggest probably uh, concern for the cattle industry and most of our livestock, interesting to say to you, is, is I don't want to say it's the, the ranchers themselves, but is that the health issue, to make sure that they're all getting uh, vaccinated or getting their bulls are getting tested for trichomoniasis, to make sure that so the neighbor's bull's not getting the Tim stuff and causing him a whole lot of havoc that could ruin his bottom line in a heartbeat if that happens. And so, you know, it's a protection of that. I think they know about them. I think that there's still some more stuff we can do. We also have a loan program, which, uh, uh, Tim alluded to a little bit earlier, but uh, you know, just about every one of our uh, divisions have a program that is there to protect either the producer as the producer or even as a consumer of those products. We're going to take a quick break here on the county seat. We will be right back with our conversation about ag and food and the business side of agriculture. We'll be right back. There's a little place on a Utah map. I was raised where my heart's at, where the sagebrush grows wild and high, and the stars come out at night. Oh, there ain't nothing like being raised in the basin with the youth reservation, skin starvation, that Duchesne County life. What do you picture when you hear Rich County, Utah? Bear Lake Adventure? Snowmobile action, pristine skiing, spectacular solitude. Well, if that isn't what first came to mind, then you just don't know Rich County. The Bear Lake Monster Polar Plunge, snowmobiling Monte Cristo, ice fishing Bear Lake, skiing the backcountry, fishing at the Cisco Disco. Come and find out what you never knew you were missing. Rich County, Utah. place that is beyond words. There is nothing to be said, except take your time in Bryce Canyon country. Planning your next conference or corporate event, the Davis Conference Center offers 70,000 square feet of flexible meeting and exhibit space, plus high-tech audio-visual services that will make your event a success. Whether you're planning a training, meeting, company retreat, wedding, or large convention, let the staff at the Davis Conference Center help you arrange your next event. Located east of I-15 in Layton, call 801-416-8888 or visit davisconferencecenter.com today. Welcome back to the county seat. We've been talking about the business side of agriculture and food. These two guys right here are on the back side of the industry. They both know a lot about it. Is it remarkable to you that you can walk into a Harmon's or a Lynn's or any of the grocery store chains around this state and have the abundant supply of, of beef at an affordable price that we do? Yeah, we have a nutritious product that is healthy and protein rich and it's a good product and we're proud to serve it and the consumer ought to be glad we, but we got I just want to say government regulations we need so much of it to ensure food safety animal health safe animal health and but 
I'll tell you a little short story quick. One time I was at a, a tractor dealership with Belarus tractors, Belarus Russian. The, the factory rep was there. And we got to talking about what impressed you most about America being here. Is it the infrastructure? Is it that? And he pointed right across the street at a supermarket, and that's just what he said. You can go in there and get anything you want, anytime, anyway, you know. In his country, you wait in line to get a sack of potatoes or a head of cabbage, but he said the supermarket impressed him more than anything else being here. So we've got a safe product, we've got a healthy product, and it's readily available, and it actually is quite affordable when you compare it to the rest of the world. You know, I've, I've learned so much as I became uh, the director of, of this uh, division there, but uh, Meat and Poultry Inspection Program is one of the programs that we have at the Department of Ag that falls under my division. And the amount of work that uh, we put into it, our inspectors there at every plant that's uh, uh, harvesting animals for human consumption there, and they're making sure from the time it comes in that that animal is healthy, why it's still alive, and watches that product go to the steak or the hamburger, whatever, to make sure that it's free of of not just disease, but an antibodies or anything that could be harmful or, or whatever. And so the amount of work that's being done on the back end by these uh, 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 slaughterhouses and, and our inspectors to make sure that there is a safe uh, product out there for people to c consume is, is amazing. And it, it's also another program that really helps these guys out because we don't want an outbreak of any sort to come in and that would ruin an industry quicker than anything else. If there was an outbreak, we saw what happened with mad cow disease in the early 2000s, how long it took for us to get back to prices on the cattle industry based on that situation. So to have meat inspection involved with this is, is huge. How much of an impact does export have uh, you know, outside the United States on your business? A lot. We raise 25% of the world's beef with 10% of the world's cattle here in the United States. We got 4% of the world population. So exports are paramount. We've got to ship beef out. We can't eat it all. It's ironic that at one point in time we were the largest importer of beef and also the larger exporter. So trade markets are important also, trade agreements. But exports are really important to us. We've got to ship, and there's a demand in Asian market, Japan. That we finally opened up the China market after the BSE deal for 14 years being closed. We're shipping there, Hong Kong, Vietnam, they want our beef, and we can supply it, but uh, it's really important that. Excellent. Any last thoughts? You know, what I'd like to find out to help uh, these uh, producers out is, is what's happening in the middle there. You know, these, the uh, price of beef right now is $1.16 or so, as we say here today. Um, what we're purchasing at the stores is a lot la larger price than it is now. We need to find what's going on in the middle to where these guys, the producers, are getting paid uh, something with that, what, for their actual uh, uh, with the meat that they're actually producing and, and get the money back in their pockets. Okay, very good. Well, there's our marching orders. Thank you for joining us on the county seat uh, and tuning us in each week. Thank you for joining us here today for this conversation. Remember, local government is where your life happens, as well as your health, safety, welfare, and yummy things on the table. Be a part of it, be involved. We'll see you next week on the county seat. If you like this broadcast of the county seat and would like to see more, why don't you subscribe to our YouTube channel? Or you can check out our website or follow us on social media. If you'd like to watch a broadcast of the county seat, we're on every week, Saturday nights at 11, Sunday mornings at 8.30 on ABC4, Good for Utah.